Hello and welcome back to another video. Today in a tiny bit of a different location. I'm in Kriasavelia, close to Madalena. If you've been to Pico before, you probably know the red windmill in the middle of those wine fields behind me. You've probably been there because it's a beautiful photo spot. And today I thought I would share some surprising facts about the Azores with you all. First up, of course, the usual disclaimers. I don't mean any harm to anyone. I love this place with all my heart, but I'm also not a local, so I don't know everything. This is the perspective of someone who moved here a couple of years ago and has been living here and just loving every second of being here. And the second one is that I am on Pico Island, so of course the realities on the different islands of course are different and I'm mostly speaking from my Pico experience. The first surprising fact is that life here used to be really, really hard. Of course, when you come here on your holiday, on your vacation, it's your paradise, it's so beautiful. The ocean, the views, the nature, the wine, everything is so wonderful and it truly is. Also when you're living here, you're enjoying that stuff every single day. However, up until not too long ago, life was very, very different on the islands. In fact, a lot of change has happened in the last couple of decades, some very radical change because up until a few decades ago, life here used to be so, so, so hard. People had to go catch whales, not because they enjoyed doing that, but because it was one of the only things they could do that. And I will talk about that in a second. Um, you had very little roads, you had very little connections to anywhere else. And just a lot of the modern stuff, especially in terms of infrastructure that you see here nowadays, only came in the last couple of decades and last couple of years. And a lot of that is partially or fully financed by EU money to push the islands to get to a place of more comfort and better infrastructure and to attract more tourism. Even in the very few years that I have lived here, so much has already changed in terms of infrastructure, in terms of things that are available, like so many times. For example, if I was to say today like, oh, uh, there is no that and that type of cheese on the island. Uh, maybe if you come for a visit in a month or two, that cheese is available. Or you are here and you find something that you really, really like in a store or whatever. And maybe when you come back in a month or two, that stuff is gone and never comes back. <laughs> so things always change. They're always evolving and changing and it's beautiful. And speaking of change, the surprising fact number two is that the Azores are a true symbol for change. And I don't just mean the infrastructure and things that are available, even though of course that's also a thing, like that street right here uh, was destroyed in the hurricane of 2019, Hurricane Lorenzo, and was completely broken. I was here, I saw it with my own two eyes. And now, if you didn't know how it looked like before or how it looked like during the destruction, it looks like nothing ever happened. So of course these things, which are kind of normal, I feel like for a lot of people nowadays, but if you think about it, it's kind of wild that you have like a natural disaster and just within a year or two, it looks like nothing ever happened. Um, but that's a different topic. <laughs> I'm getting slightly off track. Who would have guessed? <laughs> what I actually mean is that people can really change once they are presented with alternatives. Not too long ago, there were still whalers out there on their small little boats hunting for whales with a harpoon in their hand. And it was a hard, tough thing to do, both on the environment and the people. It was a very dangerous job. And some of these people are actually still alive today, which shows you that this is not that long ago. And while the people who risked their lives for their community are rightfully praised as heroes of the history of the Azores, it is of course not a great thing to do, to hunt down such majestic animals and kill them for their oil and whatever. And before you judge, by the way, a lot of you guys that are a bit older probably have washed your clothes with the oil of said whales because big companies like Persil and some others used to buy that stuff from the whales. So no judgment. 
And now, a few decades later, those people that used to go out to sea to hunt those whales are now sitting in the vigias, which are the outlook posts for the whale watching companies. So they are using their experience and knowledge and wisdom to help out a relatively eco-friendly kind of tourism. And I'm not saying whale watching is super eco-friendly. I feel like everything that has a motor and is out at sea is not ideal but we don't live in a perfect world and the people here need to earn money and the tourists come to see the whales and it's kind of a peaceful enactor and a lot of the companies really try to be as eco-friendly as they can be and you can really see the progress from hunting whales and killing them to protecting them and wanting them to be in the base alive and really wanting them to be here because they are now something that is not to be killed but something to be cherished in that way, we can really see that change is possible once people are presented with an alternative. And the Azores are a wonderful symbol for that. The third surprising fact leads us to another tourist attraction. And that is that the most beloved hydrangeas are not actually native to these islands. If you come here as a visitor to the islands, especially in the summer and especially on the islands of São Miguel, Fayal and Flodish, you will be very, very familiar with the hydrangeas or how they call it here, hortensias. These wonderful thick bushes with their beautiful blossoms in white, pink, purple and blue are so common all over the archipelago. Because of that, they have literally become a symbol for the islands to be found on postcards, souvenirs, and when people think about the Zoris, they often associate them with this very specific flower. And while they're very beautiful, they're not actually native from the archipelago. The reason why we have so many is because they were planted. Hydrangeas grow into very thick, big bushes and they grow really really fast especially in this climate and we have a lot of wind here especially in the winter so along a lot of paths or streets or next to fields people and especially also the government used to plant a ton of these plants to protect a little bit from the wind then eventually they became so popular with tourists that now they're obviously also being planted for their beauty this wouldn't be a huge issue if this plant wasn't invasive as shit. Um, <laughs> if you are, for example, on the island of Flores and you see those beautiful cliffs, you will probably see that a lot of them are completely overgrown with hydrangeas because the population of this plant has just gotten completely out of control. And it's not only on the island of Flores, it's pretty much on almost all the islands. Once hydrangeas are established in a place, they are very hard to get rid of and they will always come back. Hola, boa tarde. And honestly, I don't really know what the official opinion is on these kind of plants. I guess there are like people that see it like this and people that see it like this. But the only thing that I know is that they are still being planted. So there's definitely not like a stop on the planting in any way. However, if you go to the island of Terceira, to the wonderful spot of Furnesto in Schofre, which is this beautiful place that you can hike through, that is like very active volcanic soil with a lot of steam coming out of the ground, there used to be an initiative to clean the entire space of that specific spot from any non-native and non-endemic plants. This was a lot of work for the people that did it, and I can just... <laughs> Pay you my respect if any of you are watching this, probably not, but like just just such a huge respect for you guys for doing that. But I used to see this place for two years over and over again when I was working as a tour guide. And at the end of those two years, there were hydrangeas popping up again, which just shows you how aggressive this plant is. But it also shows you that there are initiatives that are trying to protect and re-establish endemic plants, which are so crucial for the ecosystem and which are pushed aside by lots and lots of non-native and invasive species like the hydrangea. Surprising fact number four, the first settlers were not all Portuguese. If you look into the official history books, the first thing that you're gonna see is that the Azores were an empty group of islands that was settled upon by the Portuguese about 500 years ago. 
And while that is kind of correct, it also kind of isn't because the first settlers, especially here on Fayal and Pico Island, were actually mostly Flemish people, so people that came from the region of Belgium and the Netherlands. The Flemish were looking for a new home at the time due to some political stuff that was going on. And for example, on the island of Fayal, I don't know why I'm pointing there because it's literally there <laughs> right now. But on Fayal, which was settled from 1466 onwards, this first settlement or this first official settlement was led by a Flemish man called Josef van Horteren. Porteren. I am so sorry, I'm very sure I butchered that name. He had promised his fellow Flemish people that not only would they find a new beautiful home, but that they would also find gold. Which doesn't exist here. The only thing that exists here is um, lava rock. <laughs> The reason why he did that was because he had some relationships to the Portuguese um, royals at the time that were ruling the country and there was just a lot of political stuff going on that I'm not gonna get into right now but it is an interesting chapter in history. And if you're anything like me, you might be wondering if these islands ever had any indigenous people. The official records say no. They say that these islands, all nine of them, were completely uninhabited by the time the Portuguese came around and claimed them as theirs. Uh, I don't know if I like to believe in that, <laughs> but I don't have any proof against it. However, I, I strongly believe that people used to be here. I don't know if there was ever a group of indigenous people that were living here or if there were any people around when the Portuguese arrived 500 years ago. This is an area of very strong volcanic and earthquake activity, which means of course something could have happened, so people left or died or whatever, and there are no big remains of anything in terms of like buildings or whatever. We have a few tiny pyramids, but that's about it. On the island of Terceira, an archaeologist also has found some remains of, I think it was money, if I remember correctly, uh, from the Phoenician area. So there are some things. People definitely have stepped foot on this archipelago before the Portuguese 500 years ago. But if there was ever a long-term settlement or even a group of indigenous people, we don't know. There is no proof for it. And as long as there is no proof for it, the history books are going to stay the same. However, one thing remains true, and that is that the Azores from day one of their official settlement have always been a multicultural place that has always been welcoming to travelers and people that are looking for a new home. Be it the Flemish people, there were also some German people, for example, Martin Berheim, who invented the globe later on after he married the daughter of that first settler dude from the Flemish people and then left her. You had French people here and there are also a lot of Brazilian people here. And just in general, it is just a place of people coming together. And I feel like that is one of the reasons why the culture here and why the people here are just so welcoming to foreigners, which is absolutely beautiful and something that is very, very rare. And the last surprising fact is that sharing food is the people's love language. I feel like every single country, nation, culture, ethnic group always have a special relationship with food. No matter where you're from, I'm sure you have that one dish that is like very common in your culture or that everybody loves or everybody hates or something that is just very connected with your heritage. Coming together over food, I feel like is one of the things that are almost universal on this planet and something so, so beautiful. So by me saying that sharing food is their love language, I guess it's the love language of almost everybody, but it is very much practiced here and that makes the difference. For example, you have cultural traditions like Matanzas, which are unfortunately kind of dying out. <laughs> um, but basically what people would do in the winter time, the people would kill their pigs and then prepare all the meat um, and like freeze it or, or um, make it into things like sausages and that kind of stuff. But they don't just do that alone. First of all, they come together as big families, like everybody of the family and sometimes also neighbors are involved and are coming together to make this happen. But what goes alongside with having to kill this animal and preparing the food that is gonna feed you for a very long time 
is also a feast. And the hosts invite the people that are closest to them, which means that foreigners have a very hard time getting into and I am forever grateful for the Matanzas that I was honored to attend. I will never forget them. They are so special in my heart just because I know what an honor this is to be a part of this as someone who isn't from here. These feasts go on for the entire time of the Matanza, which can be two days, three days, and you have lunch and you have dinner and it's just a lot of food and a lot of people coming together and people actually getting fed. If somebody cannot make it because, for example, they're sick or they're too old, the host sometimes will take a full huge pot of food and bring it to the person so they can kind of still attend the Matanza, even though they cannot be right there with the other people. And then you have things like Espiritu Santo, which is the most holy day or time period in the calendar of the Azorians. And while on the surface level it's just like this Christian thing, in reality what it really is, it is about feeding people. That is really at the core of Espiritu Santo. If you are lucky enough to experience any type of Espiritu Santo activities and festivities on the islands, you will see there are tons and tons and tons of bread and the sopa de Espiritu Santo and arustos and so many amazing foods and people come together and they either donate money or they just come to eat. Totally depends. Every tiny town has their own tradition here. And originally, when Espiritu Santo first became a thing, the church didn't approve of it because the idea, while still being Christian, was really about feeding the people who need to be fed, the people that needed food, that they would get fed and in a grand, wonderful manner. And the church was like, ah, I don't know about that. <laughs> Eventually, they of course accepted it, but it is still at its core a festivity of feeding people and coming together and eat. And the third and final way this really manifests in the culture here is that once you spend some time here and when people start to like you, you will find food in front of your door all of the time, especially fruits, oranges and bananas, that kind of stuff. But people just love to leave food at your door and share food with you. And not just like, oh, there's like one, bunch of bananas. No, they're gonna leave you like a full box and like kilos and kilos of food just because. And if you go and ask, for example, your neighbor like, oh, do you have like some eggs? I need three eggs for an omelet. They're gonna give you 10 if they have, you know, and probably fresh from their chickens in the garden. And I feel like that is something so special, this generosity and this sharing of food that really, really brings you together. And it's really beautiful. Let me know what surprised you about the islands or maybe about the home that you live in. Let me know down in the comments below. Goodbye.